Hello, this is Richard Cespedes, and I'm here to talk about the Riemann hypothesis. Um, I made a video about it a few months ago, and it wasn't anything mathematical. It was just about uh, a basic theory that I had that I believe that all objects follow in the quantum structural level. All objects are built upon the prime and non-trivial zero blueprint, the randomness of how primes and non-trivial zeros arise is how all things are created in the smallest quantum structural level before they come be, before they become a whole of a mass that they are now in the smallest levels they follow those energies and those energy levels those quantum those quantum levels those quantum patterns that happen in nature i think that nature itself follows prime numbers and how it structuralizes things into existence and the smallest level the quantum level i believe that nature follows the primes and non-trivial zeros in terms of uh, um, building them from the ground up before they become a whole mass that they are now and the smallest level nature follows this structural blueprint and builds upon that randomness of primes to build something from the smallest until it becomes a whole of something solid in our reality. Uh, just like I spoke about um, the snowflakes, snowflakes, they all have all the snowflakes are all di they all follow different patterns. They're all they're all built different patterns. Everyone says the snowflakes, no snowflakes are all the same. Now I I believe that uh, the primes have something to do with this the prime the nature the the nature of primes are in nature the way the way that nature itself is created and manifested is <clears throat> is through the structural blueprint of primes you know primes are nature and nature are primes they're one of the same in terms of how things are structurally created from the ground up from zero to one you know everything is built up of these numbers and the non-trivial zeros and I kinda feel like the blueprints the 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 blueprint the the primes follow or give the blueprints to nature and nature follows those blueprints the primes gives them and and um, the snowflakes the ridges of the snowflakes the patterns of the snowflakes the dimensions of the snowflakes are all due to the random structured blueprint of the primes and non-trivial zeros. Every edge and nook and cranny of an object, which in this case we're talking about the snowflakes, every dimension of that snowflake, every sharp edge of that snowflake, you could consider each of those edges a prime or non-trivial zero. Um, and I also believe that this is just not limited, as I said before, to, to, uh, to snowflakes. This is this is for all objects that exist in our reality in nature, in our in our multidimensional reality in nature, in our reality. A tree bark, the sharp edges of the tree bark itself, all those sharp edges could all be considered uh, non-trivial zeros and primes. Um, the um, the existence of of even objects that look sound and solid, manufactured objects, toys and plastic and things like that, in the quantum level. They are all follow the primes and non-trivial zero structural blueprint to where they become into existence. And uh, there comes the blade of grass. Everything looks solid on the outside, but when you look deep into it in the quantum level, everything has sharp edges and, and uh, um, is rigid and everything. And all those ridges and edges that meld itself in the smallest level are all primes and non-trivial zeros. Everything in nature follows this. Remember, primes are nature, and nature are primes. They're one of the same, you know. And um, things may seem though it's like we're right now we're looking at the the construct of the primes at the smallest level. But once we understand and we look back and step back at the larger picture, you know, not just the droplets of a of a painting when you look too close to a painting you notice all the ridges and droplets but when you step back and watch it from a distance you see that it makes something that all those droplets and ridges um, manifest and become 
a, um, a coherent image, a, a, a solid object. So what we're doing is that we had to step back. We had to analyze close, but at the same time build, and then try to step back and look at what's being constructed to understand that the primes are just not random, but the randomness leads to a structural sound coherent um, um, manifestation of whatever nature is trying to hide from us, uh, our reality of all objects, a coherent sound image that, you know, we have to step back from it. All the primes are all building to something that's coherent, coherent and structurally sound, but we have to step back from what we're analyzing in order to see that. And that's exactly the same with the snowflakes and the and the blades of grass and the trees of the bark and the sharp edges and ridges of a mountain, you know. Um, and uh, right here on the screen, we have the the zeta function, the second part of the three part. I'm talking about the second part where the real part of s is equal to 0 0.5, where the real part of s is in between 0 and 1, which is 0 0.5, 1 half. And I'm talking about the second part. The zeta function comes into three equations, three parts. This part, um, the part that you see that's written in red on the screen is the second part that I'm going to show. It's an infinite description. We're only going to use the first part of the sum, uh, which is n equals 1, which is right down here to the left. Negative 1 to the power of 1 plus 1 divided by 1 to the power of 0 0.5 plus 2 times i, which is a complex number which all advanced mathematics utilize is complex numbers on the xi plane. And so what we're going to do is we're only going to use that, only that one first fraction, only that one first part of this sum of the zeta function. This up here is um, an addition, is, 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 is going to be a product. Everything's going to be a product. You know, everything's going to be built upon. We're going to find a summation of all of the infinite sum and then we're going to multiply this part with that basically what we're saying but we're only going to use one the very first part of this summation of the zeta function multiply that with this and get this amount down here 1.224 negative 0 0.3 uh 32 i 1.24 uh, subtract 0 0.23 multiplied into i negative 0. 3, 2 multiplied into i. So this right here, the 0 point uh, up here in this top part, that used to be an s. We are now replacing s with a complex number, 0 0.5 negative 2 point, uh, um, 2 multiplied into i. That's an imaginary. This is the real part of s right here. And we're going to multiply that into this. So in the bottom part, this is the equation before we plugged in all the values. Before we plugged in all the values into the variable, which is uh, the in parentheses to the left, in the, in the very bottom last part of this picture, of this screen in red, which is the equal sign to the left of it. This is, this is the second part of the zeta function without the values being plugged into it. This is it when the values are being plugged into it. And this right here in the middle of the screen where I'm pointing at in the middle is what it equates to when we only multiply the first part of the summation of the zeta function with this. Just the infant description of the first part. 1.24 negative 0 0.23 multiplied by i. Which this is actually a point on the xi plane. On the xi plane. Right here is actually a point. This is a positive point on the x, and this is a positive point on the y. So it, it all coincides into one area. That's complex numbers. This is actually a point up here. 0 0.5 negative 2 times i is actually a point that meets. From the y area, which is now i, from the x area, they meet. Whichever, how high the amount is. So right here, this point meets. But it's kind of a large amount. When we add the second part of the sum, which is n equals not 1 but 2, to, to the second part of the sum, which is right here, when we add the two first uh, parts of the summation, which is the first part, which is n equals 1, which is down there, to the part 
of n equals 2, which is not seen, we're going to find a value that's totally different when it's multiplied with this. And that value is equal to 0.4154379571058H1I. And that is a point. This is large, but when it's multiplied, but when you have Instead of 1, we're using 1, but instead of using 1, if we were to add both both two different uh, parts of the summation, the first and the second, not the third, but the first and the second, n equals 1 and n equals 2, and multi add them and then multiply it with this, then we will get that value, which is much more smaller. Again, this is larger, but once it's added to another summation amount which is n equals 2 which is i because on the left side we're looking at uh, negative 1 brought to the power of 1 plus 1 divided by 1 to the power of 0 0.5 plus 2 times i if we were to add that to the second part of the summation which is negative 1 brought to the power of 2 plus 1 divided by 2 brought to the power of 0 0.5 plus 2 times i then you will get a total different amount you will get n equals 2 would equal to 0 0.369, um, 723671, uh, negative 1.5150558 uh, multiplied by i. And adding all those things together would equal to 0 0.4154379571, negative 0 0.69510558, multiplied by i, which is a point which is a point and actually that is a very sound that's exactly what we want we're trying to get closer and closer to find a non-trivial zero and because those two points are very small we're, we're going in the right direction and the more and I, I would assume because I'm learning that when we add n equals 3 to n equals 1 and n equals 2 and then multiply uh, sum those things up and then multiply with this top part I would assume they'll become smaller because it, it would start off large just by adding this and multiplying the first part of those two. So um, basically in the nutshell, I'm still studying the Riemann hypothesis. This right here is the second part when the real part of S is, is in between 0 and 1. The first part is when um, the real part of S is greater than 1. And the third part of the zeta function is when the real part of S is less than 0 on the negative sign. But we're focusing on when the real part of S is in between 0 and 1, which is 0 0.5, 1 half. And this is what we got for right now. So this is, a, this is just a small description of what I'm learning. And uh, again, this is a Riemann hypothesis. I'm still studying it, but I still feel that everything is structuralized and everything follows the blueprint. Everything that's manifested in reality, that's made in reality in the, an organic structural manner, follows the the randomness of the of the blueprint the very blueprint of the primes and non-trivial zeros in the in the quantum structural level everything is built from the primes and non-trivial zeros blueprint again this is ricky says thank you for watching and uh i appreciate it thank you